So if you look at like data breach and security, like today, that's already an issue. So will AI make it easier or harder? Well, the weakest link isn't actually the software, it's the humans. Yeah. So as long as humans keep doing silly things, there's going to be data breaches. That's just human reality. Welcome to season two of Practical AI, everybody. My name is Jeff, and I'm with Peter Lin. We are sponsored by Pocket AI. Pocket AI is a tool that allows you to perform surgery on your models to make them better. While everyone today is talking about rag and refinement, Pocket AI allows you to edit your weights directly. Peter, our topic today is one that actually came in as a request from a, a listener watcher, um, and that is just generally speaking, the risks of AI. It seems that um, AI safety is kind of a, syn a synonym with alignment, which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting just in and of, in and of itself. Um, and it seems like people are really, really stressing the the risks and, um, you know, the sort of the doomsday stuff, loss of jobs, nuclear war, Skynet, the whole thing. So I think people wanted just to kind of get our perspective on what are the risks with AI? Um, what are the opportunities and sort of what are we balancing here? So that's, a, that's a great question. I think being afraid is actually perfectly natural and you should have some level of fear um because if you didn't then that would be a concern <laughs> um but i think i'll just relate to my own experience when when darpa first created the grand challenge which was to have a vehicle drive autonomously in the desert and the first year i think the furthest that a car got was like 10 miles and then it ran into a ditch. The second year, actually, it came down to CMU and Stanford. And the winner won by time. And I think, I forget the exact numbers, but more than five teams actually finished the course. So back then, I thought, well, okay. It's taken us like 30, 40 years to, to get to the point where a car can drive in the desert by itself using sensors and whatever, and finish. And then a few years later, they had the urban challenge, which was to have a car drive in an urban environment. And again, the winner won by time. So it wasn't, could you do it? It was who could finish it with the fastest time and the fewest mistakes. So back then I thought, well, okay, if I project out, when will cars drive autonomously and i thought because before that i thought it would be another 50 or 60 years but when that happened i thought okay well maybe it'll be in 20 years but now we fast forward to 2020 and elon was saying by end of this year full self driving will be released <laughs> then i thought okay is that going to actually going to happen so i thought it's likely that by 2025 that that might happen. But now we're 2024, and I don't think full store driving will not be released to the broad public by 2025. That's not going to happen. Because it turns out the last bit, the last 5% is actually super hard. The first 90% was actually a lot easier than the last 5%. Which means that maybe by 2030, we'll have full store driving that's good enough that most cars will have it and people will trust it enough to use it. So I think if we apply that to language models, will there be jobs lost? Eventually, yes. But it won't be that the that jobs will just vanish in general. The jobs will change because someone will still need to look at call records, look at chat dialogues, some humans gonna have to make some judgment and annotate that data so that it goes back into the training model. Um, okay, so there will be some job loss, but it will be more job change, which is consistent with history, right? Um, throughout 
history as technology has advanced, um, people, it's not like people complained that there were no dishwashing jobs anymore. Uh, there were just other jobs. All of a sudden there were dishwasher repair people and, and whatnot. So that makes sense. Um, but what's interesting about what you just, the sort of the story you told is that there's a sort of long arc of, of something coming from nothing into like this really, really profound technology. Yeah. But this last percentage, while it might be a very, very tiny percentage, 1%, 5% of the journey, while it's a small fraction, it is a significant fraction that is going to take a long time to 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 get through. So it's super yeah. important. Yeah. So um, is this kind of the case with a lot of the stuff in AI where, yeah, yeah. Where it looks like it's going to happen quickly, but just it's not going to happen that quickly because there's a lot of stuff we're not thinking about or or that right. last percentage is, is a lot. Yeah, if we just look at jailbreaking language models, right? I mean, GPT-2 came out back in what, like 2020. We're, in, we're already in June, 2024. And jailbreaking is still just as easy as it was in 2020. And if we look at the research, really not much progress has been made on preventing jailbreaking because we we actually can't understand what the weights are doing and we can't interpret what the weights are doing and until we can do that having larger and larger models like if gpt4 really is a trillion parameters it's a mixture of eight different models well if you just increase if you increase the parameter by the order of magnitude you get to 10 trillion you just made it harder for yourself to prevent jailbreaking. Right. So when you do your models using pocket AI, you you can see the weights, right? You know what's happening. Could you prevent jailbreaking in your model? Currently not yet, but the hope is you shouldn't have to build larger and larger models, right? Because we look at Llama 3 versus GPT-4. GPT-4 or 405 is supposed to be a trillion, but cheap but llama three the middle size one which is um, 70 billion it's an order of two smaller and yet it gets comparable performance right so and in the literature there's this idea that really a small percentage of the weights in the model does most of the work so this is called the sparsity problem that really when you train these large models you need it to be big in order to have it figure out what patterns are in human things like language. But once it's trained, it's actually a small percentage of the weights that are actually important. Um, and I, there's quite a bit of research showing that that's the case. But what we haven't figured out is how do we actually figure out what those weights are? Once we do, then I believe that we will be able to build much smaller models that are like under 5 billion, that'll be just as good or if not better than models that are like GPT-4 or 5 or even okay. GPT-5. So is the implication that it's hard to get around jailbreaking models until the models are a lot smaller? Is that what you're saying? Well, it's, it's both. It's harder to prevent jailbreaking because if you have 10 trillion parameters, you have to figure out what's important. Yeah. You're just searching a much larger space than if you have a model that's only like a hundred million parameters, right? It's like it's like asking someone, "Go find me this mouse in New York," versus "Go find me this mouse that's could be anywhere on the planet." Yeah, <laughs> still hard, <laughs> still hard. But like one you could do, the other one you can't. <laughs> okay, so back to the risk question. So covered to a certain degree, you know, jobs. There will be jobs will be lost or or changed. But what about the rest of it? Robots and, you know, uh, data breaches, people stealing your identity and, um, you know, Skynet, you know, like what's what's the rest of it? Wow. So if you look at like data breach and security, like today, that's already an issue. So will AI make it easier or harder? Well, the weakest link isn't actually the software, it's the humans. 
Yeah. So as long as humans keep doing silly things, there's going to be data breaches. That's just human reality. I mean, it's not like you can wave a magic wand and be like, oh, GPT-8 is going to magically secure things. It's like, no, <laughs> that's not how things work. <laughs> if someone writes their password on a stick pad and then someone comes in and steals it, yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, that's how the movie War Games gets started, right? <laughs> um, okay, so what about like uh, Armageddon, nuclear war, something like that? Well, I mean, my personal bias is that humans are the, the really the, the real threat isn't the models themselves. It's the people running the companies. Because when you have absolute power, it gets really easy to get intoxicated with that power. So extrapolating out from that, the real risk is that too few people have too much power in AI. Exactly, yep. Yeah, because then it's much easier for a few people to take control of everyone. Whereas if we make AI accessible to everyone and it's, it's in the hands of everyone and anyone can train models, then the, the playing field is much more level because now you don't need to go to Microsoft or OpenAI or Anthropic or AWS or Apple for a model because then you can just build your own. So who cares? Yeah, it's kind of like kind of like the printing press thing from centuries ago, right? Where it was viewed as this, you know, out of control risk. Yeah. Just what would happen if people other than monks could distribute literature, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something like that, right? Yeah, well, yep. <laughs> yep, when, when, uh, when, what was it, the Roman Empire formalized the Bible, they picked the different books and compiled it, and then they threw away books that they didn't like. <laughs> and then they printed that over and over and over and over again. Yep. And then only the monks could control it until the printing press came out. Then it was like, no, nope, anyone can write books. Anyone can share knowledge. Yeah. And as a result, we had that huge boom in knowledge, inventions and innovations and people sharing ideas. And we had this beautiful flowering of art and literature and technology, which I feel like once, once we get to the point where AI technology is accessible to everyone, we're going to see another kind of shift where a ton of people will get to build cool AI, cool technologies that other people can use. And then, I mean, businesses will still have, a, you know, their things that they'll do. They're not going to go to business. So the Amazons, the open AIs, the Microsoft will still be there, but you know, people have a choice. So if I had to sum it up, no, AI is not going to kill us. People will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the best way or the, 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 the straightest path to not a, a destructive future is that more people have access to this, not fewer. Exactly. Yep. That, that's my bias perspective. Being an open source guy, like even the open source has been co-opted by companies. The reality is anyone in Africa with a computer could go download any open source library and, and start learning and do stuff and change their lives if they want to. So yeah, like Red Hat got bought out by IBM. That's fine, but there's still, Linux is still open to anyone that wants to use it. Good, great conversation, Peter. Thanks for the feedback and the, and the opinions. Uh, we will try to provide uh, as much um, intel and and uh, feedback as we can. It's great to get questions like this from you, our audience, and if we can get more, we'll try to address them. Peter, everyone, thanks for watching and listening, and we will be back next week. Take care.